Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, today I'll be uh, talking about getting more nines from your deployment under the DevOps track. So I think uh, some of you were there in the tutorial session, which we explained how to deploy, manage, administer, and monitor WSO2 products. Uh, so uh, this can be an extended version of that one. And uh, I'll, uh, some of the information I'm sharing here was covered during the tutorial as well. So uh, before we start, like, uh, are there any, uh, anyone here, is there anyone here who is responsible or who is managing a deployment which is critical? I mean, every deployment is critical. Um, OK. Yeah. Couple of guys. That's good. Otherwise, I'll be talking to a wrong audience. <laughs> so uh, during this uh, session, so I'll, I'll uh, talk briefly about the challenges which, which affects the, the nines. You know, the nines means the availability. Uh, then uh, I'll be talking about architecting the deployment because that's something you have to do before you start your deployment. And uh, importance of using the DevOps support. Uh, then I'll be talking about a uh, little bit about monitoring your deployment because that's also critical. And communication, which uh, which is something you might not see as important, but it's very important, and some best practices. So the challenges which affects the number of nines of your deployment. Uh, one thing is like, so in your deployment, what you have is software. And software are prone to fail, that, that's, uh, failure is inevitable. And uh, they do have bugs, because uh, they are being de uh, developed by humans. And we all know there aren't any bug-free software. Uh, so if you come, uh, if you like survive the first two, then uh, you have to face the maintenance work, because uh, time to time you will have to do upgrades, patching, and uh, you'll have to add new nodes to, the, the, to your deployment, and so on and so forth. And uh, also, there is a possibility that uh, you might face unexpected load as well. So you might start your deployment expecting certain load, but uh, after some time, there may be situations where you have spikes and uh, the deployment cannot bear that. So these are some of the challenges you face when uh, trying to improve your availability. So first of all, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, architect the, architecting the deployment. So I'll go from the beginning to the end. Now this is just a deployment diagram. This is uh, I just uh, found it from one of our uh, documentation uh, in, in our documentation site. Um, this is uh, this is an API manager deployment. So you see. Uh, there's a publisher, store, key manager, and gateway. Uh, there's nothing, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't guarantee about the, the uh, accuracy of this one. So j I just put it to show this as the deployment diagram. Now, the thing is, this will work in the happy path. This has one publisher, one store, one key manager, gateway, and the databases, everything. Uh, so once you set this up, this will work in the happy path very well. You will be able to create APIs, uh, publish APIs, subscribe, uh, invoke them. But what about uh, if one of these goes down? Your entire um, scenario, everything will start falling apart. So that's why you have to architect your deployment very carefully. When architecting the deployment, one of the major challenges you face is you are so if you are de if you are a deplo uh, deployment architect or if you are responsible for the deployment, the problem is you are not the architect of the software. So you will be deploying something you get from uh, a product team or a vendor. For example, like in your case, you are the you are the customers of WSO2, so you will be deploying the products which is de uh, developed by the WSO2 developers. Um, although you are not the architect of the software. There, uh, you need to know how it works to some, at least to some extent. You need to know the weak points of the software. And uh, why, why I'm saying it is like, uh, it, you, you won't be deploying only a single instance. Uh, your deployment will have multiples of products. It, it can be WSO2 products, other, uh, some prerequisites or some 
some other software which is needed for example it can be a message broker or uh, some other uh, software which you publish data from WSO2 products. So uh, you need to know how the, uh, the, the information flows between your deployment because you have to identify the weak points. And then you have to think about a way to address those weak points. So uh, let me take an example. So uh, there may be a scenario where one product talk to the other and uh, because of architectural limitation, let's say product X and Y, uh, due to architectural limitation in uh, product Y, that product may not be deployed in a high available manner, which means you won't be able to deploy two instances in active active manner of that product. So we know that's a weak point. Then you have to come up with a way uh, to mitigate that weak point because it's a potential failure. So you will have to talk to product uh, X and check whether there's a way of like whether they have uh, a reliable messaging capability to uh, mitigate the mitigate if product Y is down. So those kind of uh, uh, workarounds should uh, be available. And uh, most importantly, so in, uh, your, since your deployment uh, consists of multiple components, you need to have high availability for each, each of the components. Otherwise, you can't, as the deployment owner, as the owner of the deployment, you can't guarantee that the message entering your system will uh, go out safely uh, in the case of failure of one or two instances. And another important thing is load balancing. So there are certain load which products can tolerate. So you have to have capacity planning and you have to see, okay, how much of, how much, uh, how many instances you need in your deployment. So Chintana covered the capacity planning section. So uh, when architecting the, architecting the deployment, you have to uh, do capacity planning and come up with the numbers of instances you need. And uh, so you might sometimes find, okay, one instance is capable of uh, catering the limited traffic you are getting. But uh, when we consider high availability, you'll have to, like whether you like it or not, you'll have to deploy two instances. So that's something uh, that's out of your control. And, <coughs> and another thing is the potential failures. For example, let's say you are deploying, uh, you are deploying your uh, products in your, your data center or some other uh, infrastructure uh, provider, let's say Amazon Web Services. So what happens, you know, uh, uh, in the cloud, anything can go wrong anytime because uh, it's not in your control. Either, even though it's in your control, things can fail. So let's say uh, there's a network failure, which means uh, one component cannot talk to the other component. So you have to think about those scenarios as well, the potential failures. For example, a, da a database can go down. Uh, network will be unavailable. So you have to think about those things as well. And if you are not satisfied with the proposed uh, deployment, then you have to fight for a good one or uh, a one which can mitigate those failures. Now, assuming that you have come up with the deployment architecture, uh, so, uh, let me uh, so go a few years back. So, when I joined the industry, so when I was working as a, a software developer, I was managing uh, a deployment as well. So, we were developing the, uh, the application and we were the people who were deploying that as well. So, we were having Tomcat, uh, MySQL. So, we were pushing the application to Tomcat and uh, doing all sort of things. But... Uh, Although we were doing that, we knew that we didn't, uh, we didn't have much knowledge about the, the stuff like the Linux uh, best practices and uh, setting up database systems and all those things because uh, we didn't have, uh, not we, uh, me, didn't have enough uh, knowledge, but we were doing that. So if you are managing a critical deployment, it's highly advised to get the service of some DevOps. So most of the uh, companies now have DevOps teams. So I, I was trying to find a proper definition for DevOps, and this is something, uh, this one, this is something I found which I could understood. So it says, uh, it's a study of building, evolving, and operating rapidly changing resilient systems at scale. So that's something, uh, that's the only definition I could understand because uh, that's what our DevOps team uh, does in WSO2. Uh, so that I thought of putting it here. Uh, so the DevOps, they can automate the deployment uh, each and every corner of that one. So uh, 
uh, the devops i know they are some they are they are a lazy kind of like human beings uh, that's what i have that, that's what i have heard from uh, the devops team lead in wso2 so he he advises his team members to automate everything so you have you don't have to do it again and again so that's actually a very good advice so they can automate everything which uh, you might not be able to and then something uh, something which is very important these days is configuration management so in auto scaling uh, scenarios and uh, disaster recovery so you need to bring up new instances very quickly you have to uh, uh, restore backups and all those things so for that you need to have configuration management tools like uh, buffer chef uh, and ansible and all those tools at least you should have your own mechanism uh, to manage the configurations otherwise you will have to bring up a vm download the pack configure them and do everything and while uh, when you are done with that the the uh, damage might be already done and uh, so the devops they can schedule maintenance work. They, they they should schedule maintenance uh, not like ad hoc stuff and uh, they are responsible for backup and restoration of the data so whenever something goes wrong things and things can go wrong so if something goes wrong you should have at least some backed up data to restore and get things back on track So uh, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, monitoring. One thing which is very important is uh, you need to be alerted in advance. So uh, alert, getting an alert when something fails is not good enough. You need to know at least a few minutes before it fails. So for example, is like one thing is let's say uh, you are running a, a product in a, in a VM and uh, suddenly uh, the product stops working or it crashes due to ha not having enough space in the device so the log cannot be written and things get crashed so you will get an alert uh, when it crashed but the thing is like what if you were able to get an alert uh, when the when the disk, disk space was 80% or 90% full uh, so that's why i say you should get alerts in advance so it's not only for disk space memory uh, load average everything and uh, you have to you can be smart with alerts which means like you can uh, you can have multiple levels of alerting like we alert at one stage uh, saying okay there's a problem and when the problem grows uh, you say okay now uh, you send you get another alert saying now it's a, it's in critical stage so the responsible people the responsible person for these uh, to handle these alerts uh, they will know okay we have to attend on, attend to this one and you should have multiple layers of people to attend these as well because like people can fail like uh, they can fail uh, fall sick so you ha you need to have multiple levels as well <coughs> then uh, so i i mentioned this in the tutorial as well there are three levels of monitoring or three, three ways of monitoring first thing is we monitor the physical servers or the v, uh, the health of the vm the virtual machines that is for example one thing is the disk space uh, the ram usage uh, the load average and uh, monitoring that is not enough because uh, you might be running multiple products multiple uh, jvms in a, in a one instance so you need to measure the jvm health as well uh, how much memory it is consuming so you might have allocated 2 gigabytes of memory and we need to know okay whether it's uh, uh, the heap usage is coming closer to 2, two, two gigabytes or uh, it's is it running with high load average all the time so we need to be uh, we, we need to monitor them as well uh the other thing is uh, the functionality of your deployment so although you monitor the the vms and the the jvms you can't guarantee that the functionality will be there for example uh, a server will be up and running but due to some instance uh, the, the the port will be available but due to some some instance uh, it won't serve your traffic so to cover this you need to have some test of your own for example it can be a soap ui uh, soap ui uh, invocation a jmeter invocation or some java client or some other uh, client written in other language which invokes uh, your proxy service or the application or uh, something like that uh, so f you need to have test for all the critical scenarios of your deployment uh, that's the only way to uh, guarantee a better sleep for you in the night so uh, these are some of the monitoring tools we uh, use in our deployments um, so all these uh, these uh, these three are from the the devops monitoring stuff so 
uh, one is from Nagios and uh, I think all of them are from Nagios except the one at the top. So that is something uh, we have written because like so all these monitors the VM and JVM health but the one in the uh, top right hand corner was written by the developers uh, specifically to uh, check the functionality. So uh, if you see, uh, so this is, uh, this, is uh, this shows the health of our API cloud. Uh, so we have written certain tests to cover certain, certain scenarios like, uh, and uh, we keep them uh, running periodically. So if something goes wrong, uh, the DevOps get alerted and then they can uh, attend to it. Now, uh, so I said communication, you might think that what's, what's, there to, what's there to be done with communication when it comes to the availability of the deployment. So uh, I'll explain. Now, uh, I said that you are, you, are, you are deploying something you get from a vendor or a, a development team. Now, when you get that, uh, when you're planning the deployment, I said that you have to understand how it works. So in the initial de uh, deployments, you need to understand how it works, what are the components, how the components talk to each other, sequence diagrams, actuate diagrams, all those things you need to understand from one end to the other. Uh, then there are upgrades. So upgrades also, you get instructions from uh, vendors or product teams. So when, they, when, there's, when, there's, when, there's, when there's an upgrade going, uh, upgrade recommended, you have to now uh, think of what are the upgrade steps, like what are the components being touched during the upgrade, how it affects my deployment, so uh, how it affects the availability of the components, how it affects the users, so you need to uh, learn that as well, and uh, similar thing in patching. So you need to know what is happening. Now, since you are responsible for this stuff, then uh, after you learn these things from the vendor or the product team, you have to communicate this to the DevOps. So. Uh, one thing is you have to, uh, it's, it's, it's better if you can uh, have something like submitting maintenance jobs to them with proper information. Uh, when, you, when you want a patch to be applied, so you submit a maintenance job saying, okay, I want this patch to be applied. Uh, this is the reason why I'm applying this patch and these are the instructions and uh, these, these are the things you have to uh, take care of when applying this patch. So you have to provide proper instruction. And uh, it's not good to uh, have like this maintenance work done in each and every day because if there are due to some reason, uh, if there are some components which gets affected during restarts and all those things, if you keep on restarting or applying patches each and every day, which means that affects your uh, availability values, figures. And also you should encourage the DevOps to uh, use checklists. So I'll, I'll come to checklists later. And another area which is important in communication is communication between you, the deployment owner, and the end users. So we know that something uh, during maintenance or if, uh, during maintenance, like end users might get affected. So there are some maintenance work uh, which we won't be able to do with zero downtime. So you have to notify them in advance. And uh, also you should try to make at least part of your deployment available for them so which won't make their lives miserable. <clears throat> now I'll uh, talk about some best practices. Um, so one major thing is like uni it's better. So if uh, is there anyone who uses checklist or who encourages using checklist in your deployments? Yeah, that's 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 very good because like uh, it's people who carry out these operations and then uh, they can do mistakes and we don't know like when they do when they might do this mistake. So it's better, a person who knows the stuff well creates a checklist and asks them to follow it. And that will avoid any chance of doing mistakes. And also, we, can, we should define processes. For example, uh, applying a patch, there should be a process. For example, uh, it should be applied in staging or uh, QA environment, if things aren't working only, uh, you should apply it to uh, live, and it is all. It also should not be applied on any given day. There should be a maintenance day or maintenance period which uh, you have to apply. So those kind of process should be defined. And you need to have automated tests for your deployment. That's the way. Like that's the only way you can like. Uh, so if you are planning to have CI/CD, uh, you need to have automated tests anyway. Uh, if you are, if you, like, at, or if you are doing frequent uh, deployments. 
you need to at least have some automated steps because after pushing new application or a new version of the product, you can run, write, uh, run those automated tests and make sure that the tests pass. Uh, if they fail, you don't push it to live. Uh, you need to have at least a staging setup. Uh, what I'm, why, why, why I'm saying at least means like staging setup won't be enough. You need to have dev and QA setups as well because developers, they want to work on, uh, uh, developers working in their machine is not enough because when, they, when, it, when those, uh, uh, the code or the product or the applications deployed in staging or uh, QA, things might fail because they might not have thought about uh, the, the load balances in front of the product and uh, certain, certain other stuff. So you need to have uh, multiple setups for dev, QA, and uh, staging. And it's, uh, it's mandatory to verify every change before pushing to production. And uh, uh, you, it's better if you can script the operation. Script means like not the shell scripting scripts, but uh, scripting the steps. For example, if it's an upgrade, uh, it's better if you can come up with a flow of events like First, you have to shut down these, you have to uh, put the maintenance banner, then you have to uh, add this component to this server and restart it, but other server should be running and serving traffic. So there should be a, a script which describes how the event should happen. A an upgrade kind of thing is an event, actually. And uh, after all these uh, important tasks, it's better to do postmortems because you can, uh, the postmortems are a good way which you can identify where things went wrong and uh, improve. For example, if something went wrong and it affected your availability, uh, to avoid that happening in the next time, what you can do is uh, improve your checklist based on that experience which you find out during the postmortem. And also, you should HA your DevOps as well. If there is only one person who is uh, like who has the knowledge of a certain area of the deployment, and if that person gets sick and if something goes wrong on the same day, you can't wait until that person comes back. So you have to HA your DevOps as well. So the key takeaways of this session is like you have to define processes, create checklist, uh, review the scripts, and verify uh, before pushing to live. And um, finally, what I would uh, want to request is like you have to fight for a res resilient architecture. Like uh, so, I sometimes fight with the product teams for uh, the improvements I need from them because like. Uh, I can't be responsible for the failures which occur uh, due to the issues, issues in products. For example, uh, they, uh, when the, there might be certain metadata or certain stuff which uh, the developer adds to the database or the file system or the registry. And when we delete those things, uh, some uh, the, the, the partials might get remain, um, remain and by, ta by the time it can grow and uh, cause uh, bad performance in the system and uh, can even bring the system down. So you have to be like careful about those things and fight for uh, a resilient architecture. Uh, if you can't do it, uh, you can get the service of the WSO2 managed cloud services, uh, which means you can get the service of the WSO2 DevOps team. So that's, uh, that's an offering uh, we have. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>